ancient grains are plants that have been cultivated for centuries, some for even longer, providing sustenance and nourishment to communities who cultivated them. Ancient grains are now largely forgotten, but might just be the key to helping those communities adapt to a changing climate. Ito ay ginagamit namin dahil kita ko talaga pagdating doon sa mga drought, ang bilis niyang maka-adapt, hindi siya basta-basta. The grains are conditioned by nature, trained by their terrain. Some survive with little water, while others tower above high waters, while others bear well with intense temperatures. Jadi sudah bisa melihat tuh bagaimana adaptasi ya. sorghum terhadap perubahan iklim. Ya. Artinya walaupun tanamnya terlambat, tapi dia masih mampu, mampu mengeluarkan, ya, mengeluarkan biji. Ah, ya. Ancient grains have adapted to local climates and are better suited to changing weather patterns. But many have been lost in the pursuit of modern agriculture. Now, a growing number of small farmers are turning back to tradition. Mereka bilang kami makan ini, kami makan sorghum, kami makan jagung lokal. Tuh, kenapa kamu melupakan makanan ini? And for some, they had the last time they'd eaten it was when they were children. I know that's true for me, but even that memory for me is is rather vague. But these memories are starting to return. Could ancient grains help slow down the effects of climate change? Ini sebagai pulau kelapa. Jadi kelapa itu dia ada di, di dalam di belakang desa di, di belakangnya. Ini kan perkampungan kan. Nanti kita akan melewati semata-mata hanya kelapa. Semata-mata hanya kelapa. It was almost 20 years ago when Maria Loretta abandoned life in the city and what could have been a promising legal career to move here. Adonara is part of a chain of islands in eastern Indonesia known as Flores. Apa yang terjadi ketika saya memilih ke sini? Saya melihat kehidupan ekonomi yang luar biasa kata petik itu miskin, ya. Tetapi lingkungan kami di sekitar kami Di sekelilingi kampung ini ada kasyunan, ada mente, ada kelapa. Lalu apa yang membuat mereka tidak berdaya? Apa yang membuat mereka tetap miskin? 80% of Adonara is farmland, but it's extremely dry. Coconut trees tend to do well here, but they're highly adaptable plants. Corn and peanut crops haven't tolerated the changing climate quite as well. In the past, 
farmers were forced to plant rice, a staple in Indonesia. Rice planting in Adonara came about from the country's transmigration program started by the Dutch during colonial times. The practice continued long after Indonesia gained independence. Farmers from densely populated Java were given plots of farmland in rural Indonesia. The aim was to reduce overcrowding in Java and for farms to provide work and income for rural residents. Those early pioneers transformed the area's landscape. The authorities even provided subsidies for fertilizer, pesticides and irrigation. But in the semi-arid landscape of Flores, most rice crops failed. Padi pemerintah itu kan padi yang membutuhkan input luar yang sangat tinggi. Jadi persawahan harus airnya cukup. Kemudian sistem irigasinya dengan sumber air yang cukup. Kemudian perbenihan juga dari mereka bukan dari sini. Jadi yang saya menangkap cerita dari mereka, mereka dipaksakan untuk menanam. Tetapi toh akhirnya pemerintah daerah kan punya kebijakan. Kebijakan bahwa ya pusat boleh memaksakan, tetapi kan pemerintah di daerah mengatakan ini kita mau buat seperti apa lahannya, sumber airnya dulu dong. Sumber airnya nggak ada. Bagaimana kita mau menanam padi yang membutuhkan air banyak? Ya, seperti itu, nggak bisa. The failure of Adonara's rice farms would lead to an exodus of growers, especially those trained in working with ancient indigenous grains. Over time, those ancient grains, eaten here for centuries before the advent of rice, were forgotten. Sorghum was one of them, and it was a key feature in most Adonaran's diets. 90% mereka lupa. Lupa dengan makanan mereka, lupa dengan benih ini, lupa dengan sorghum. Karena ternyata sorghum ini ada nama daerahnya, nama lokalnya. Waktu itu, ketika saya keluarkan, saya tunjukkan, oleh, itu yang di Manggerai, aduh, ini mesak. Dia bilang, ini namanya mesak, hmm. yang menjuntai. Lalu saya keluarkan satu lagi yang berdiri, sorghum itu. Dia bilang, ini pesi namanya. Maka beberapa orang tua itu sampai ada yang menangis. Tetapi ini hilang karena daerah kami dijadikan pusat padi. It wasn't Indonesia alone that lost its indigenous crops. In the Philippines, indigenous rice varieties were forsaken in favor of higher yielding ones. To combat a rice supply shortage in the 1970s, the Masagana 99 policy was introduced to increase rice production in the Philippines. The authorities sold Filipino farmers a genetically modified, high yielding variety of rice. But for it to thrive, Farmers needed fertilizers, pesticides, and other modern farming inputs, all of which had to be imported. Indigenous farming practices, which served communities for centuries, soon became forgotten. It was erased, and the farmers then turned into agricultural workers of very specified roles farming because of that. Additionally, the, the seeds that the farmers has been using before, before Masagana 99 was virtually erased and was replaced by only a handful of high-yielding varieties like IR8, IR20, IR and so on. So back then, the Philippines used to have a 4,000 uh, traditional rice varieties and now it was erased. In the meantime, many Asian countries started exporting high-yield rice. It soon became cheaper to import rice rather than grow it. Many farmers in the Philippines struggled with sinking incomes. In the wake of Masagana 99, the Masipag Farmers Network was founded in 1985 to promote a holistic approach to agricultural biodiversity as well as to improve the lives of farmers. Masipag wanted to revive local indigenous rice 
and get farmers to stop planting genetically modified varieties. They scoured the Philippines to collect these ancient rice grains to be stored in a seed pan. Today, they have a collection of over 2,000 indigenous rice species that are planted and harvested every year. This living seed bank ensures that the seeds stay healthy. Each seed has unique characteristics that are recorded and studied. So, marami tayong mga binhi sa masipag na na-identify ng mga magsasaka natin na talagang uh, nag-a-adapt siya or umaangkop siya doon sa nagbabagong panahon. Uh, maraming mga binhing masipag ang napatunayan na talagang matibay sa tagtuyot samantalang ang ibang mga binhi naman ay na-identify din or napatunayan ng mga magsasaka natin na matibay sa baha at meron din tayong mga binhi na uh, nagpapakita ng uh, resiliency or matibay sila sa mga peste. Tayo ay nagsusulong ng likas kaya sa karanasan ng ating mga magsasaka mas mababa ang nagiging gastos nila dahil unang-una, lebre ang binhi or hindi siya binibili. Pangalawa, uh, hindi, na rin ta, hindi na rin sila gagamit ng mga synthetic na fertilizer o mga chemical na inputs. So doon pa lang, uh, malaki na yung nasave sa gastos ng mga magsasaka. So kaya tayo sa Masipag, uh, atin siyang uh, inaalagaan at binubuhay natin yung sistema ng uh, libreng pagpapalitan ng binhi at uh, pag uh, uh, pamamahagi para na rin sa kapakinabuhan, lalo't higit ng mga maliliit na mga magsasaka. Once harvested, the grains are separated. The seeds are grouped and packaged, ready for distribution to farmers. As our planet continues to warm, some believe that these ancient grains might be the key to helping farmers tackle climate change. You have to be really meticulous in terms of finding the right varieties that will adapt to the specific environment, especially to the, to the effects of the climate change. I do believe in the potential and the power of ancient grains. Actually, it's not only limited to ancient or traditional grains, but to the farmer bread grains, basically any grains that is being cultivated, being bred by the farmers. Those are the varieties, those are the grains that will really stand the challenge of climate change. Adonara, like the other islands in Flores, have an arid climate. Rice doesn't grow well here. Not for the lack of effort among farmers. But sorghum does. Soon after moving back to Adonara, Maria was introduced to the grain by her new neighbor. Saya makan, aduh gila, enak banget. Saya minta lagi, dia bilang, ini juga dia dikasih oleh kakaknya dari tetangga desa di sebelah. Jadi kakaknya itu menanam sorghum tadi itu, sorghum lokal. Dan dimakan ketika menunggu padi matang, atau dimakan ketika musim pacaklik, ketika padi sudah makin menipis. Yuk kita lihat di dalam ya, ini kena angin ya, nih ya. Sebaiknya ini yang kena angin ini, ini harus dibantu supaya dia jangan, yeah. ya ini kan dia, ini harus dibantu, diikat pakai tali rafia, yeah. sehingga dia jangan, orang jangan potong, belum matang betul ini, diikat, begini, jangan biarkan begini. Okay. Baru juga ada, ada angin halus, oh. hujan, hujan apa, lebat juga. Hujan lebat. Baru-baru nah, ya. Intrigued by the grain, Maria decided to plant some of her own and was delighted that they grew well despite the arid conditions. The plant could withstand strong winds, unlike rice, 
and only required a fraction of the water rice needed. Maria then set off on a mission to introduce sorghum to farmers. More and more farmers are getting interested in sorghum. Kita harus utamakan ini lumbung kampung tengah, lumbung keluarga kita, kemudian benih, dan yang terakhir baru jual. Jual itu artinya ini sudah apa namanya sudah berlebih ya hasilnya produksinya sudah berlimpah itu kita bisa jual tapi kalau memang kebutuhan di dalam rumah tangga kita masih kurang sebaiknya kita konsumsi dulu ya Maria has spent the last 13 years evangelizing the merits of sorghum kami juga mementua semua it wasn't easy convincing farmers. Sorghum was hardly heard of among consumers. <laughs> Petronella was the first farmer in the region to take a chance on sorghum. Semua orang itu pada pendirian mereka tidak mau karena hal ini hal baru. Jadi mereka belum pernah to. Jadi saya bilang biarlah barang ini mungkin baik sehingga bisa datang di kampung kita, di desa kita. Akhirnya saya menerima, saya menerima datang uh, tanah. Sudah kerja habis, bersih habis. Jadi habis itu datang panen, panen. Habis Pak mereka bawa ke sana untuk Pak mereka jual ke bagaimana ke. Dan saya lihat kebun Mama sekarang lebih besar. Dulu kan hanya sepetak. Mm -hmm. Petak itu saja. Ini lurus ke sana, tapi ini sudah ke kiri. Dengan situasi alam yang terus berubah, ketika hujan berkelimpahan masuk sampai ke musim kemarau, atau ketika kekeringan yang terus-menerus terjadi, ternyata sorghum mampu menjawab perubahan iklim. Dan ini nggak main-main. Artinya, eh, kalau masyarakat tidak mau berubah, masyarakat tidak menempatkan sorghum sebagai menjadi bagian makanan, makanan mereka, maka apa yang terjadi? Ya, kita tidak bisa berandai-andai, kita tidak bisa um, apa namanya bermimpi yang muluk-muluk tentang situasi alam. Kalau diri kita juga tidak mau berubah, maka bagaimana masyarakat menyesuaikan dirinya dari biasa makan beras padi, tapi sekarang berubah untuk makan ini. Dan makan sorghum ini bukan sekedar makan sorghum, tapi dia baik untuk kesehatan, bahkan nilai gizinya jauh di atas padi dan jagung dan nilai ekonomi juga baik sekali. While parts of Indonesia are extremely dry, in the Philippines it's the opposite. There is too much rain. Some farmers whose rice fields have been devastated by the floods have moved to the highlands, but even here the rain is incessant. Ryan Damaso is the local advocacy officer for the Masipug Farmers Network. Kamusta na yung mga tanim mo dito, yung mga alaga mong mga halaman, tsaka mga gulay? Ayan po, pag minsan umaani, kaso ngayon ay humihina ang aming mga tanim. Humihina ang ani nyo ngayon? Bakit? Tuwa po siguro nang nagdaan na tag-ulan at ano bang tuwa sa binhi. The Philippines gets hit by about 20 tropical cyclones a year and they're getting stronger. Madalas na mga pagbagyo, 
madalas at mat- matagal na mga pag pag tag-init no ay napapansin nila na parang kumokonte o lumiliit yung kanilang ani yung uh, nawawala yung mga topsoil o yung mga patabang matatabang bahagi ng lupa no dahil sa tuwing madalas ang ulan na erode ito o na inaagos ito kaya nawawala doon ng nutrisyon no so kung lagi at palagi ang mga pagulan naapektuhan ng kanilang ani sa kanilang mga pananim but ancient grains are hardier crops and they're now being studied for their ability to adapt to the frequent floods the municipality of real is on the east coast of the philippines largest and most populous island luzon Darius Garango has been a rice farmer all his life. He carved out a small section of his field for use as a test farm. In it are a variety of indigenous rice seeds from the Masipag seed bank. Ito po ay yung tinatawag naming maintaining trial farm and verification. Meron po kami dito ngayon na labing limang klase ng binhi na naandun sa maintaining trial farm at dalawa yung nandun sa verification. Meron traditional rice, merong masipag rice at yung farmer bread rice. Yun po ay ginagawa naming estratehiya para mapalakas din yung tinatawag na pangunahin yung bayanihan. Yung pagta-trial farm, dun sa masama yung lahat ng mga miyembro o kasapi para gumawa nang gawain dun sa trial farm para dun din masukat yung pagiging naming farmer scientist. Darius, nung nakaraang taon, nung nakaraang taong taniman, kamusta From the trial farm, Darius will select the two best performing varieties for that season and plant them on a large scale. Continually assessing the plants in the trial farm allows Darius to observe which plants adapt better to the changing climate. Napakalaga din ng uh, trial farm dahil dito din na-encourage o nahihikayat ang mga magsasaka natin na kalaunan ay maging breeder o yung tagapagparami uh, ng iba-ibang lahi ng mga palay na una ayon sa kanilang lokasyon at saka pangangailangan o yung preparation. Kung gusto nila ng mabango, matangkad, maraming bumunga o kaya naman ay sa kulay o kaya naman ay sa lasa. Depende sa kagustuhan at preparasyon ng mga magsasaka. One of the varieties of rice Darius will always have at the ready is PBB402. PBB is made up of the initials of the farmer Papito Babasa who bred that variety of rice and the region Bicol which is the southern section of Luzon Island. It's a variety that is flood resistant. Kahit palubog ng tatlong araw, after ng baha, nandun buhay pa siya nakatayo. Oo, naobserbahan ko na ito dito sa mga nakara kalamidad. Yun po ay ginagawa namin bilang masipag farmers para dun nga sa tinatawag nating adaptable dahil ang Pilipinas po ay talagang prone sa iba't ibang klasing kalamidad na andyan yung bagyo. Minsan nga dumarating tayo sa mga El Nino o yung drought. Farmers that plant these varieties of ancient rice tend to do better than other rice farmers. Ancient rice with their better yields could boost the country's food security. According to a 2022 article published by the Carnegie Endowment, the Philippines is the most food insecure country in emerging Asia due to its reliance on imported food to feed its expanding population. The country has consistently been one of the world's largest importers of rice. Can farmers plant a more diverse range of crops to mitigate the effects of climate change and continue to have economically viable farms?
Dia Widoretno teaches in Gunung Kidul, a rural farming village in Indonesia. In 2008, she set up what she calls a life school. Lessons here teach students about the specific geographic and environmental conditions of their village. This so they can respond to real life problems facing the community. Besides climate change, the other big problem in the village is the soil. Dan kebetulan kita berdiri hidup di atas lahan kars gitu. Jadi lahan kars itu adalah lahan yang terdiri dari batuan gamping. Jadi lahannya itu terdiri dari batuan gamping. Banyak ahli e, mengutarakan jika dulunya ini di masa purba lahan kars ini e, adalah e, dasar dari laut purba gitu. Beribu berjuta tahun yang lalu dan setelah mengalami evolusi perubahannya menjadi seperti yang sekarang kita lihat ini kita huni sekarang. Tapi karakter kars itu tidak hilang di mana e, Kars itu uh, tidak bisa menyimpan air permukaan. Jadi sederas apapun uh, curah hujan yang datang ke, at ke atas tanah, dia tidak bisa menyimpannya. Karena pori-pori me menyebabkan semua uh, air hujan yang masuk itu tidak bisa disimpan di dalam tanah dan dia akan diteruskan uh, ke sungai-sungai yang berada di jauh di bawah tanah dan akan terus dialirkan ke laut. Sehingga hidup di atas kars, berarti uh, mengalami uh, uh, kesulitan air karena tidak secara umum tidak akan ditemukan air-air yang ada di permukaan. There is water in underground aquifers, but accessing those would be too expensive as they're too deep underground. Farming in Gunung Kidul has always been a tricky business which most young people have turned away from. Many have already left for the cities to find other work. Generations old wisdoms of farming the traditional way are now in danger of being forever forgotten. Kita perlu membangun kedekatan, intimasi anak-anak dengan uh, dengan potensi yang ada di sekitar mereka. Oleh karena itu kita mengembangkan beberapa metode yang membuat mereka anak-anak maksud saya, anak-anak kelompok anak-anak sekolah pagesangan punya kedekatan, punya interaksi dengan tanah, dengan benih, dengan lahan, dengan tanaman, dengan binatang sehingga ada interaksi dekat yang membuat mereka ada koneksi ada hubungan, ada keterikatan, keterikatan yang uh, memunculkan emosi. Ya, itu itu yang tidak bisa dipelajari hanya dari buku bacaan, tidak bisa dipelajari dari menonton video saja gitu. Itu memang benar-benar harus ada sentuhan, ada interaksi panca indera gitu. Lima panca indera kita harus melakukan interaksi pada hal-hal itu gitu untuk membangun kedekatan. Despite less than ideal conditions, lands here have been farmed successfully for years. Dia wants to impart traditional farming wisdoms to farmers across the country. One such tradition, the growing of multiple crops side by side on the same plot. Di awal musim hujan, mereka akan menanam semua jenis uh, tanaman pangan yang dibutuhkan, mulai dari rempah bahan utama, pangan pokok, sayuran, buah, semuanya ditanam. Misalnya mereka menanam singkong, menanam padi juga, menanam jagung, menanam kacang-kacangan di ladang yang sama. Kalau saya hitung rata-rata setiap lahan itu lebih dari 10 jenis tanaman. Bahkan tanaman pisang, buah-buahan, juga kelapa gitu umumnya juga ditanam di satu ladang gitu. Nah, karena tanaman-tanaman itu punya daur hidup sendiri punya umur panen sendiri, jadi uh, waktu panen dalam setahun itu bisa beragam. Multi cropping is not only better for the soil, but also allows for the plants to shade each other, 
to help reduce moisture loss. And if any crop fails, farmers still have other crops to bring to harvest. Farmers in the village are reverting to these old farming practices and unlearning modern ones involving the use of chemical fertilizers which kill crops that could be mistaken for weeds. Sebenarnya menanam keningkir sangat mudah. Bijinya tinggal disebar, nanti akan tumbuh sendiri ketika musim hujan. Saat ini keningkir masih menjadi sayuran kesukaan saya. The island of Cebu in Central Philippines was home to the country's first capital. It's also where a number of indigenous crops once forgotten, are making a comeback. This farmer's market features a variety of them. Teresa Ruelas runs an NGO called Communities for Alternative Food Ecosystems Initiative, or Cafe I. She runs this and several other farmer's markets across the city. Gigon sa ganin ni mo ni pagdala, I mean, daghan ba ni sa inyong yuta, uh, sa inyong farm? Yes, kay ang amo ang lugar good Bugnaw. And then ang sayuti mo turok sa Bugnaw, mabuhi sa Bugnaw. So, we had a, we have a lot of sayuti in my farm. Yes. Mm, yeah. Kung daghan sa kay ko mga uh, produce nga sayuti din uh, para dili masayang gamiton buhato na mo og uh, one of our ship uh, introduce our sayuti chutney, uh, sayuti pickled sayuti, so no, nothing left, nothing uh, wasted. wasted. One of the most popular ancient grains in the farmer's market and grown in Cebu is kabog millet. It's a millet grain that was first found scattered in bat caves. Bats in Cebuano are called kabog, nearly forgotten as a food it has recently been revived. One dish containing it is budbud kabo, a sweet treat now popular amongst Cebuano households. So, ato ani aron makita ninyo yung pwede ni natot. Ablihan. So, mostly, ang pag-abli ani is arira sa may tumoy and then diretsyo imuharang Kasi sa money siya inaong sa kabog. So, ready. So, this is the traditional way it's eaten. It's peeled like a banana and then just eaten straight up. So, it's a little bit sticky. It's a little bit sweet. And it's very good. So, it really became very popular again. It used to be popular as I was growing up and then it disappeared. And then it has returned thanks to them bringing it to our markets. Teresa doesn't just run farmers markets. She also works with farmers to promote organic and climate resistant farming practices. So I think that when we were teaching organic and regenerative farming, it brought back for them some of the old practices that they had forgotten. And so for example, water systems, simple things like water catchment. So they've had to really learn to adjust to the weather extremes, the climate extremes, like having better rain catchment systems and really looking at the land for where water flows 
and working their way with that, where they plant even the, the exposure to sunlight, intense heat has had them change the way. So it's really learning and relearning how to position plants, what plants grow best with other plants that will resist certain insects. To protect them against strong typhoon winds hitting the country, millet is usually planted on the edges of farmlands, near forests that provide shelter from the extreme winds. And now, with warming temperatures, farmers rotate their crops frequently, much like their ancestors did for centuries. Gus, niya ikoman, kabog naman, niya dayon tinuganay. Oh, ang palibot, palibot ang gabi, bulang hoy. Dirigyo, dirigyo kita sa sa. Oh, dito abos kamote. Ah, oh, mauni kuan. Asa ka magtanom o sab o kabog? Oh, dito lang kaya pon. Dito sa babaw. Lain na sa mga lugar. Oh, lain sa mga area. Dili ni panahon nga kinintig tanaw kay uwan, dayon pa doong init. Oh, gitis tingan lagi yun, uksirba lagi yun sa panahon. Ancient grains are growing in popularity in the Philippines. In the cities, they're marketed to niche consumers, those who want organic, healthy alternatives. But their revival brings along a new set of challenges for farmers and the rural communities. Some of the challenges are, once word gets out about how great these crops are, there's a tendency for international buyers to come in and they're able to purchase them at very high prices, which then is good for the business. However, what it does is it cuts the accessibility for local food producers and for customers to afford to buy their own raw materials. As farmers start to plant more varieties of ancient grains, new and interesting foods could soon enter our diets. Foods that could be good for us and the planet too. Maka dengan gerakan pangan lokal ini kita mengangkat kembali pangan lokal yang hilang diangkat kembali. Orang awalnya itu kan heran dengan hal ini, karena malah anak-anak sekarang kan tidak tahu lagi model model apa sorghum itu. Maria and Father Benjamin are allies in an ongoing movement to revive Indonesia's ancient grains, starting with sorghum. Benjamin heads a farmer's cooperative that manages crop prices, keeping them stable. He wants farmers to earn decent incomes while making sorghum affordable for consumers. Kita menjadi sehat. Dari sihat, tenaga kuat, kita berpikir untuk mengembangkan lebih besar lagi gerakan sorghum ini, sehingga kita bisa jadikan itu untuk meningkatkan ekonomi. Kita pasarkan. Ya, kalau kita sudah sudah sehat, kita kuat, kita membuka semakin luas berhektar-hektar kebun sorghum, kita bisa pasarkan. Kita jual itu menjadi pemasukan bagi keluarga. Dan selama ini sudah ada bukti untuk di sini uh, banyak. Yang semakin yang berhasil dalam gerakan ini petani-petani di sini dia sudah punya punya rumah yang bagus, rumah yang bagus, pendidikan anak-anak juga di perguruan di. Meanwhile, in West Java, Helianti Hillman. Connects people living in the urban centers with the country's forgotten indigenous foods. The former lawyer had become fascinated with Indonesia's vast diversity of indigenous plants and their heritage. It inspired her.
to set up a company to distribute them. I think the, the most difficult part in the beginning because I, was, I did not know anybody. You know, so once we get to know the, uh, the network of the indigenous community, the farmers, so it's much easier because they only like text away. You just need to text message them and say like, okay, who have this, who have that? And then we just aggregate that. But of course, right now it's easier because, you know, we have the database, we have the network, we have the, you know, uh, we know this, uh, these communities. So in the beginning, it's really about to immerse ourselves to get to know these communities. So there is a cross-learning among the network of indigenous communities, and there is an exchange of seedlings, uh, seeds, which allow them to survive the, the changes of the condition. Heliantis products are distributed across Indonesia and internationally. They've provided a stable and sustainable source of income to local farmers and artisans. And despite them being priced at a premium, to support remote smallholder farmers, they're catching on with consumers. It definitely would not be affordable in the beginning, so that's why we are targeting a niche market who are willing to pay more, either because of the health or uh, the mindfulness of being socially and ecologically responsible. But as we grow the market gradually, then the volume getting bigger and the production cost is getting lower and our product become more and more affordable. You cannot separate between food, especially local food, with your identity and your culture because basically it shaped the whole social dynamics with it. The way that you plant it, the rituals, the collectivity when you are doing things. So for example, uh, in West Java, in the indigenous community like uh, Kasapuhan, they do the rice growing is more like a rituals and it involves the whole village. So when you stop doing that, so the connection between the community also get lost because food connects people. So, and uh, it also represents your identity. But I think uh, we have to also understand the nature of how this food is being produced. These rural farming communities are changing the way we think about food and our over-reliance on just a few key crops. A diverse array of ancient grains ensures that rural communities like these can survive and create new economic opportunities. For the rest of us, these grains are alternatives to our current diets, alternatives that are healthier and more sustainable. Jadi sudah bisa melihat tuh bagaimana adaptasi yeah. sorghum terhadap perubahan iklim. Artinya walaupun tanamnya terlambat tapi dia masih mampu, mampu malahnya mengeluarkan ya, mengeluarkan biji. Nah, ya. Kahit malaki ba yung istro, ah, rice istro niya? Mas matibay siya. Mas matibay siya doon sa, sa hangin. hangin. At bukod pa doon, after ng kuman, parang bumabangon siya. Yun yung sabi nga, panalangin ng isang magsasaka. Ngayon, sana naman, huwag tayong gambalain ng tinatawag nating kalamidad. Oh. Sa kalamidad, wala tayong magagawa. Sana, ito na yung pagkakataon Yun, na makabawi tayo at magkaroon ng marami-raming surplus. Oh. Kita nggak lapar sebenarnya. Kami di di Flores ya di Adonara di sini kita nggak lapar sebenarnya. Kita punya ketika uh, padi jagung kita sudah habis, kita punya pilihan makanan yang lain. Ya. Kita masih punya sorghum ya, masih punya kacang-kacangan, kacang hijau. Tentu akan nilai tambahnya akan lebih banyak lagi. The climate change in a way, yes. It is daunting, it affected the, the crops, but at the same time, it forces us to start looking into a different kind of crop that have resilience to that. And actually, this is also um, the, the movement of going back to our heirloom edible plants is actually also driven by trying to find solutions against the uh, climate change.